perfect. All right. Thanks for joining our ongoing interview series. Today I'm speaking with Aaron Whitlatch, who uh, I did a podcast with before because I thought he was a good conversationalist. And we talked about how to have good conversations. And so we're going to attempt to implement that now and keep it open-ended just because I think you are, you are a talker, right? Would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> you sent me a list of things that you wanted to talk about, and then I have a short list of mine. Uh, James Blake's new album. Who was first? Oh, album of the year, dude. <laughs> 2019 release. Yeah, it just okay. came out on Friday. And so it came out at midnight Eastern time, and by the time I got to work the next morning, I'd listened to it 12 times. <laughs> Verdict album of the year. It's so good, you know. The only thing I know about uh, James Lake is uh, the "There's a Limit to Your Love." That's the only thing I know. Mm-hmm. Is is it more of that? Uh, it's sim. This newest album is a little bit. It's more approachable, I would say. Okay. Like uh, his music is largely really weird. He's. He's apparently in the music industry. He's like a musician's musician. Like he is ubiquitously loved across the music industry. Um, but he also he's a is, musician's musician. Yeah, so he sort of is like technically talented. He's very technically talented. He like started so as a the producer person. and then started to like sort of in like EDM scene and then started actually singing and just like completely pivoted his career direction. And he just like makes use of like really, really long pauses and strange sounds and like he makes things that are very interesting and not necessarily pop. Approachable. I would not say pop. Okay. And I would not say approachable (laughs) in general. (laughs) But but really interesting and his lyrics are just insane. Like they really get you thinking. Another fact about Aaron is that he makes excellent playlists. Just across the board, I think I have the fourth in a series that he calls Pros and Connor, which is just, <laughs> like, stuff he thinks... A really dumb name. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was solid. Uh, my response is the hit batch for the Wit Ledge, which I think is pretty solid. It is. I was listening to that it. last week. It's the one The one I made. I made a... I think me too. I made another one. I think it was just ABW and then a year or something. Mm-hmm. So I can come back with that. But yeah. yeah. I asked you maybe a month ago, about playlist management. Yes. It's a work in progress, dude. It's so hard. And it is very much limited by Spotify's current capabilities. But in general, I am constantly exploring new music, so I just make a new playlist once a month, and everything that I've discovered in that month is self-contained in that playlist. I do the same thing. And beyond that... (laughs) There's no rules. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's like how, I mean, it depends on how you want to listen to music. I know a lot of people create playlists for moods, but then I think that's really... They get dated fast. They get dated, they're, yes, and they're very limiting. It's all like every time you put a song into a playlist that's supposed to have a mood, you're all of a sudden deciding forever that that is the only mood I can listen to this song. In. And that song, like, right. songs are multidimensional. Lyrics can mean anything. You can be super affected in different ways by the same song at different points in your life. I, it just as, seems too narrowing for me. As far as mood playlists go, the best ones are the ones in Spotify makes because they can keep them fresh. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah, they do yeah. a better job than I do. So because that's what I guess I, I wish I knew how they were put together. Just. I assume they team up and they're like, okay guys, here's a box, put in all the like coffee house acoustic stuff that probably belongs here. They got some crazy algorithms, man. Are they made, are, I don't know if these are like algorithm made playlists though. I think they are. I don't know <laughs> enough to speak okay. about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this me, is me all these are all questions for later. Um, your Discover Weekly, good or not? It's generally good. It's pretty variable. It's usually pretty good, and sometimes, like, the entire Discover Weekly playlist could just, like, like, I always listen to it, and then I'll pick out songs that I like enough to write, to basically say Put into the month playlist. Exactly. Um, Sometimes, I'm like, they did such an effing good job that I've just, like, added almost every song. Right. 
So and I don't like good, that. It's a good shuffle, like bring introducing music. Yes. To the monthly playlist. Yes, yeah, so that's one source. I have another friend who constantly, like a long time ago, made a playlist just specifically for me. That was new music he was discovering, and it's now turned into it's called Four Twenty Four A Dubs, and a lot of people now follow this because okay. um, he found out that there were four hundred and twenty songs on it. And every time now he adds a song, he removes the song. That's smart. So that's it another. Takes time. It does. This guy, uh, he's a really good friend of mine, Brian, and he basically introduced me to like live music too, and has changed my life. What's it called? Four Twenty A Dubs. It's like Four Twenty Four A Dubs. I don't know how it's called. Okay. He briefly changed the name because he <laughs> was playing it at work. <laughs> yeah, like, it's not a great name for that. Uh, as far as best playlists that you have. Or like either you made or you subscribe to them. Off the bat, just to start it rolling, I ha- I subscribe. I typed in like Bay Area Hyphy. There's <laughs> one that's just in all caps. Uh, it says Bay Area Hyphy shit, you know, something like that. And it's all of the Bay Area classics. So we got like Super Hyphy. We got Tell Me When to Go. We got mm-hmm. it, like Fizz Dance. The whole. The whole gamut. Very high levels, um, all the way down through like the packs. Like, yes. Yeah. Um, dumb in my backpack. The one I forgot about was uh, I don't know if the song's called this. No, no. Eva. We don't give Damn. Up. We don't give up. Yeah. That. For some strange reason, if I ever have a headache and I put on that song, the headache goes away. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Makes anti sense. <laughs> so I like that playlist, and I also like I go to yours because they're very consistent. But the best playlist I think I ever made, I called Bloodstream Cinematic, and I sent you this. You told me that you made it for me, and then I found out that it was a public playlist. Whoa! Drama. I was I made it public because I was so proud of how it turned out. It was really good. Yeah. I do think that you sent it to me, and then later made it public. Yo, it was yeah, two yeah. sides. Began with the same song. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably how it's like when you like again. It's like when you send a selfie to someone. You're like, damn, too good to keep. <laughs> exactly. This conversation, like this content, is incredible. Yeah. You made it for it someone. Would be, it would be selfish not to. Yes. Um. But the idea was, it's two acts, and the and it was a movie soundtrack for a movie that doesn't exist, which I was very. It allowed me to put in a bunch of songs that I felt like were connected, but really paired next to each other don't make too much sense. Like we got uh, like Caught in the Middle for Moneyball yeah. in, <laughs> in there, like next to Mick Jenkins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how I found out about Mick Jenkins. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. He's great. So those are, those are the ones I'm most proud of. Drew Walker. Like. <laughs> Dr- that, do you know, uh, this is a side note, Mick Jenkins has maybe two to three albums out. I just found that out. And all of them are about water. Oh. And on the third album, it's funny, he has like one of these uh, tracks where he says, people ask me if I'm going to stop talking about water, and this album's for y'all. <laughs> and it's just so, so <laughs> like, it's, him saying, I'm not going to stop. And it's crazy because... He is rapping about drinking water throughout, though the speaker, his character, often will deviate and drink ginger ale. And that's like a motif throughout. It's very interesting. Okay. <laughs> I need to listen to it more closely, it's, it's is what it sounds like. Yeah. Anyway, so that's, that's my playlist focus. What about you? Uh, man. Also, okay, so my playlists are also largely driven by what upcoming shows I'm going to. Okay. And then if I'm going to music festivals, um, because I care about getting my money's worth, I need to listen to literally every single artist that's going to be there. So I'm going to Coachella this year. And even though I'm incredibly stoked about a ton of artists, I need to listen to the whole lineup in case if there's a gap in my schedule. I need to know exactly who I want to listen to. So that's actually a really good way to discover all these new artists, especially because um, there tend to be new artists performing at music festivals that are just like released either their latest album or they're a bit unknown. It's just so you're really getting this new. from like the Coachella poster. Yeah. Just going through the, going through the poster. That's pretty rad. Yeah. 
You've been doing live music stuff for a long time. Yeah. This is a part of you. I, it is, yeah. <laughs> when I went to my first, uh, it was when I moved right after college, I moved from San Francisco back to Santa Barbara for a job. And as a going away gift, my friend Brian bought us both one day tickets to BFD, which is a music festival in like San Jose, Mountain View. Okay. And um, it's been no looking back. It's, it's changed your life. Time. Yeah, it like actually has. What happened? I just didn't go to the I, t- I guess you I just went to that s- festival and you were like, ah, oh, this is a great time. I yeah. Continue doing this. I was really stingy with my money and I had yet to be convinced that like live music was worth, like I just hadn't had that mm-hmm. experience yet that was like, this is super worth me paying $35 to go see a show. And that changed it. I saw like five acts that day that I was like, that's a pretty focused camp playlist approach. Mm-hmm. It's pre gaming. <laughs> yeah, but then, but then all this just leads to if you really like this one song, then you'll go and like read up on this artist and then they talk about their influences. Mm-hmm. So you can also explore music that way. Looking at it because I like respect a lot of artists like James Blake, where does who are his influences? That's deep. Frank like Ocean is one of them. Wow! Which is a dream. <laughs> Everyone loves Frank Ocean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dope. So, like, what you're telling me is your playlist focus is kind of to prep for live music events. A lot of the time, yeah. yeah. It's just discovery. I guess I don't really. Yeah, I guess there's never really for my I don't make playlists for myself like I do for other people. Like for yours, I like meticulously think about what putting this track in the playlist would mean and like go through like I drop like 30 songs in there and then like refine it, refine it, refine it, start reordering it, listen to it a couple times in order. I'm like, does that make sense? Does this transition make sense? Like what does this mean to me? What is Connor gonna think that I think this is saying about him? You know, I get like really into it and I do not do that for myself. For yeah, myself, it's just a that, yeah. bag. And then I think definitely when you're recommending things, you have to do a lot more thinking. Definitely. I, yeah. like, I realize when I sit home and I like watch Netflix, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> like, I, like I sit down, I have the laptop on my chest, and I'm like, yeah, fuck it, I'll give this a go. <laughs> but <laughs> if someone else is in the room, I like, sweat because I'm like, I, whatever I choose, the stakes are a little higher. This index is both. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes like I have to cut out when I realize the person who's I'm with just doesn't want to watch anything like this at all. <laughs> it's hard. So the amount of thought that goes into my like personal consumption is significantly less. Yes. <laughs> all all is mostly anything. Don't. And it's just like luck of the draw. Yeah, I mean, the algorithms are getting better. Right. Now. Did you see the horoscope update today? No. I opened up Spotify on the way here and it says, hey, uh, we have horoscope curated playlists. Would you like to hear yours? And I was like, sure. I clicked on Aquarius and it gave me a mini horoscope. Oh, you're Aquarius? Program. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no one does. But I like to say it judgmentally. <laughs> um, I'm a Sagittarius, so, you know. <laughs> Who gives a shit? Um, <laughs> but the idea is, it's like, hey, here's what's in your, your constellation. Here's a playlist to help you. <laughs> here's how you should be feeling. Yeah, which seems like it could be algorithm. Did, it, did you enjoy it? I was listening on the way here. Was, Frank Ocean was the first song, so I guess it's not too bad. Which Frank Ocean song was? I was thinking about it. So, like, low hanging fruit. <laughs> Trash. I'm not going to listen to this playlist. <laughs> Alright, should we move on? Sure. Your, uh, your foray into Twitter. Oof. Yeah, I'll just start off by saying I'm not about it. Like, no? Why were you considering it? Um, for a few reasons. So, I don't know which one came first, but basically I'm like a super avid NBA fan. It is okay. the greatest sport of all time. Okay. Um, and they're doing this really interesting thing. One thing that I like about the NBA is they're constantly updating the sport. Like, a lot of people don't know this, but every single year they essentially change the rules. Like, they tweak the rules a little bit. They listen to feedback from all the players, coaches, um, fans, everything. How can we make this game more enjoyable, 
safer everything. And this year, they're starting to do, on Monday night, for the very first time ever, they have current NBA referees are going to be live tweeting during the entire game and basically wow. responding to fans' questions throughout the game because as a fan, I mean, there's at least like three times a game. Like, how the F did they reach that conclusion on this play? Like, that was not a foul! And so they're going to have the actual right. NBA that's, refs like responding. That's really cool. Yes. So that was, I see how that's the main motivation to get on Twitter. I spend the majority of my time, my free time on the internet, literally watching the NBA or perusing NBA stats. Really, I'm not that complicated on the internet. Yeah. That's what I do. And so, so that's really interesting to me. And Twitter, I found it's actually just really good. Uh, I don't know what, for whatever reason, Twitter is really good at having these short video clips in the NBA. Um, so there's like a couple columnists that I follow that just use, they'll basically embed Twitter videos. Right, and, and I've seen these uh, as a Twitter user. Yeah. Is it like, because they spill, spill into my feed. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like in the course of this conversation, I'm gonna start mansplaining Twitter to you. <laughs> so I don't know if you know about like seven second clips. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, know. I don't know what it is. They load really quickly. It just seems really good for that. So you're not gonna do it though. So, uh, <laughs> so, so then also I found a James Blake post on Twitter and it was like beautiful. He like like another reason that I've been considering Twitter is because my friend Elliot, who is active on Twitter, uh, mainly for for artists, music. He's there for music. Yes. yes, which is would be the other reason that I'm there. Basically, NBA music, just knowing about basically the you know most up to date uh, things that artists are working on or when things are going to come out. There's still really not a good system on knowing when shit is going to be released. Correct. At all. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's like a major gap in the market. I feel like a lot of places have tried, but there's no like central resource that you can always rely on. But Twitter, artists have to have Twitter yeah. like they need to. Yeah. And they're going to let you know when their shit's coming out because they want to sell it. So that would be the other reason. But yeah, into my foray into yeah. Twitter, it's basically, I, uh, I, guess, I guess I would use Twitter, but never would read the comment section. Um, I personally think I'm generally significantly happier because I don't get bogged down in the like comments and just on like, I basically spent like an hour just like, what would my Twitter be like? And like went through and like actually used it, I suppose, as if I was a Twitter user and was like reading through uh, the comments and actually kind of like the layout. Like I don't use Reddit anymore, not for like five years, but it, I think Twitter can be a little bit easier to follow people's trains of thoughts, like in the way that they're responding to each other. So I enjoy the layout, but in general, there's just like, and maybe it's just the people I'm following, but there's like 95% just like idiotic bullshit. Garbage. People are just saying yeah. things that they weren't, there's just, there's just a lack of thought, I think. The fact and that it's could, so do you think fast, you can like. Get rid of that just through following, do you think? Well, I said maybe it's the people I follow, but the problem is even, like, even all these artists, you, you can't stop people from commenting things. Right, I think it's well designed that you don't get, have to see the comments unless you want to. Like, the only way really? you can comment <laughs> is, like, yeah, if you take your phone and you're like, oh, James Lake's posted this thing, you click it, then you see the comments. So I need a, a friend to teach me how Twitter can be used, really, is what needs to happen. Because I was incredibly overwhelmed when I tried it. Yeah, myself. I mean, Twitter is, by nature, super overwhelming. And people are starting to gravitate away from it, which I think is I think it's awesome. A good thing. I think it's a good thing, too. Uh, the one that people have told me about is like, cool, Mastodon? I've mentioned, mentioned this here before, but it's because I was at a party. And so people know about it. Uh, people, like, it's, I, I think, I don't know. I have no idea how many people know about Mastodon. But the idea is it's Twitter for smaller communities. That appeals to me. Yeah. And so I'm part of one that uh, is part of a, like, basically people who are into creative, creative constraints. 
Mm -hmm. So you can only tweet if you don't use the letter E in any of your <laughs> posts. That's interesting. It is interesting, but it, it's specifically for people like me who are thrilled by that kind of thing. So anyone who's like an asshole. That would turn me off. Right, exactly. <laughs> so everyone there is like kind of weird and really into this, and so it's my people. <laughs> I can see that, like, that was a specific example, but I can see how... I guess what I want is... It sounds so stupid, but I, I just want like like-minded people with similar goals commenting on that. Like on these, for right. example, on the on the NBA comments, I want people that are literally like nerding out on like how rules are interpreted towards plays, and that's a very specific need that I want from Twitter. And it's just I just think it's too big. I and think that's, that that's yeah. not what I could get from that. So that sounds appealing to me. It does sound appealing because it's also user generated, so people can create their own groups to talk about very niche things like this. Hmm. So potentially it's offered as a solution to all of the problems that Twitter has. Okay. You can text me that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's because it is new, it is very hard to figure out. That also kind of appeals to me. Yeah. Sort of like being involved in things earlier on even yeah. if they're super broken and don't work. That's I I think uh, I was reading a thing that says if it works it's obsolete. <laughs> and I was like, ah, this thrills me. <laughs> That's great. I like that a lot. Yeah. Uh, as far as we don't have a lot of time, you want to like venture into like another thirty minute chunk afterwards if you want to. Yeah, that. sure. Yeah, cool. So the bottom line is, you probably won't join Twitter. I don't think so. Or maybe I need you or Amira to show me how to use it in the way that I want to use it. Got it. And what do you think is the main platform, like social media platform that you use? So I, I'm really bad at using so social media. Spotify counts. Um, I don't really use Spotify socially like other people do, mainly because on your phone you can't see what other people are doing, so... And I'm only ever on it on my phone, right? Like rarely actually on, on my computer. Um, I don't know, I use Instagram and Facebook, but in general I don't... I'm not super active in social media, and every time that I do find myself becoming more active, it generally coincides with, with my unhappiness. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it's been too many years of this trend for me to not completely think that it's valid. And it could just be that I'm using things incorrectly. No, I think you're totally right, because I think there is a common correlation between social media use and just being unhappy. I think in general I've never really been into like strangers on the internet. Like, I really like Facebook and Instagram and on Instagram I have a private account. I'm, I'm just like these are all people that I know. I'm like mm -hmm. getting views from people that I have met. In general every time I venture on into like the greater internet sphere I just I don't know, it turns me into like ho like hopeless hopeless cynicism. It's really not great. I'm like generally a very optimistic like Yeah because you kind of like on Twitter, like you just see a lot of garbage. Yeah, and people are really like unhappy and just think the worst about most things. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time I'm on, well, in this one hour, like for right into Twitter, essentially, it, it just seems like most people are, most people, but a lot of people are just out to like poke holes in everything. It's like, it's almost like healthy, healthy skepticism turned into unhealthy cynicism. It's trolling. Well, I was trying to, I was trying to learn more about this, yeah. and I learned that modern cynicism is a thing. Do you know about this? No. It's fascinating. There's a Wikipedia article. That's as far Mo as I got on there. Okay, but modern cynicism. Can you yeah. crash course me in this? Um, okay, so my general understanding is that uh, it's an effect of mass media where, uh, in general, people can't uh, the, the more you're exposed to mass media you just sort of start harboring more and more cynicism to the point that you can't really see the good in most things you have to inevitably first consider why things are bad and it just leads to everything being bad because i could find a reason to not do anything i really could i could probably easily find a reason to not do anything and it's a result of just being constantly exposed to news or maybe just media yes i was actually talking with uh laurel about this and she brought up i forget the name of the effect but it's essentially the fact that like since news reports 
really crazy, generally really shitty events. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes, we're good. Okay. Uh, That people tend to think that that's an accurate reflection of the world and like proportionally there are more shitty things than good things. And I just think that definitely... Got it, because that's what worth is worth reporting on. Yes, exactly. Right, and so your worldview then gets super warped mm-hmm. to the noteworthy shit that is generally bad. And I can see the value in... It's, it just goes back to healthy skepticism, where I think I'm not... I'm not enough of a skeptic. I like... I mean, this is an aside, but like a lot of people say... As like as I go through my life, like something that I really need to work on is becoming more trusting of a person, and my life arc is in a very opposite direction. I need to be like far less trusting up front. So, so you need more cynicism. I do, and <laughs> can see why that doesn't make sense with it. Yeah, I've just been saying. Okay. But I did, like the takeaway is what I'm getting is there's a balance. There is a balance, and it is the burden of the person to like be able to wield the benefits of like social media news being plugged in without like getting into this hole of modern cynicism yeah. or even just general depression induced I, by well, so modern cynicism is very much linked with depression okay yeah I can see that from the very brief Wikipedia article reading I did. And I did check out some books from the library. I'm going to do like more research on this. There's some essays on it. Yeah. Um, we should. And I will send that to you if I find <laughs> yeah. it useful. I read the prologue. It was I great. It was useful. <laughs> nice. We should, we should jump into another 30 minute block. Okay. But I liked this one because we talked about like pretty consistently music all the way into Twitter. Yes. Yeah, which I think is good. Cool. Let's go to the next one. And I'll get Jim. All right, let's go. Great. So, we had a good chunk earlier Mm -hmm. (laughs) discussing Spotify, the, uh, it wasn't the MLB, it was the NBA. NBA. NBA, and whether or not you use Twitter, and we ended with modern cynicism. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that leads really artfully into your next uh, point that you texted me. Uh, your fascination with the Internet of Things yeah. without really knowing about the Internet of Things. Yes. I want to start by bringing up something. Do you know about the Internet of Things? Uh, I know a little bit about the Internet of Things. Okay. But I think the funniest thing that I found on Twitter recently was an account called the Internet of Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole premise is they go to like these conventions and look at these startups that are pitching really, really stupid uh, uses of implementing the Internet of Things. I've heard a lot of really dumb shit. Right. What have and, you heard about Yeah, because the idea is like, oh, we're going to make it 2.0 by like throwing Internet connectivity into this very mundane object. <laughs> um, there was one, the, the one that I remember now was... Uh, like glass or a headband that you put on your baby so you could see what your baby sees at any time from your phone. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a whole Twitter dedicated to like... Would that be like for safety reasons or to literally know what it's like to be a child? <laughs> I think it's to know what it's like to be a child. Oh, okay. It's weird. But like the whole... I think it like tires developers and investors to like see these people being like, I'm changing the world by putting internet connectivity into something very simple. Mm-hmm. So like, what is your fascination with it? Because it, it's like, it's almost eye-rollingly hot mm-hmm. as far as the topic goes. So I, I come at it from a very uh, specific direction okay. where uh, it's really related or should be related to what I'm doing with work. Mm. Um, which is uh, environmental like systems, essentially. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I would say that's a good way to think about it. So a lot of what I do is assess how efficiently buildings run. And, right. and the Internet of Things makes that super easy to check out, right? Yes. So it could and should be used um, in a way where if very early on, 
Um, and I'm usually involved in new building construction. So basically throughout the life cycle of designing a building, mm-hmm. I throw some stats at you. Buildings consume, what is it, 70% of the electricity used? I forget if that's an international number or, or in America, but that's like an astonishing number, right? With 70% of electricity used. Is what? Is used in buildings. So if we can more efficiently use buildings... So, that, so that means 30% the, is just not used? The 30, 30% of the ener- like electricity going into the building is lost? Is that sorry, what you're telling me? Of the total electrical consumption, okay. 70% of that is buildings. In the built oh, environment... Oh, in the world, in the US? Yes. And I oh think my 40% God. of total energy is used in the built environment. So that also takes into account like natural gas, etc. Got it. So, so I, I explain. So seventy percent of electricity that is generated is used in buildings. Mm-hmm. Okay. You should fact check that. Yeah. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> uh, but it, it, in any case, it's like a huge number. So I specifically work in energy analysis, which is looking at um, how energy is used in buildings and how can we improve upon how energy is used to meet specific goals like heating this room yeah. and ventilating this room and daylight and like the, there's like a shit ton of glass right there that's like lets in a lot of cold and lets out a lot of heat so that's not very efficient for example <laughs> in any case the internet of things if all pieces of every system in the building are connected you can accurately find the areas to improve yeah and so there's some really cool companies that are doing cool things where essentially the way that mechanical systems are currently designed, you'll only, there's like a building operator that's constantly looking at everything. And they'll only ever see that something's an issue when it falls outside of like a range of parameters. So literally if something is broken, or like if a room has been too cold for a really long time, something's messed up. The internet of things. I like imagining like, you know, the spaceship deck port that like flashes red. Like, that's like not very far off. That's <laughs> yeah. like currently what exists. <laughs> Um, so the Internet of Things should be able to allow not only for tracking if things are working, but if they're working within the confines of how much energy they were designed to actually be using. So, for example... So your interest is coming primarily from this... From an energy efficiency <laughs> perspective. It's just so directed. Yeah. Um, but it, it can be really cool. It can be used to basically the main reason that really well-designed buildings don't actually save as much energy as they could is that the control systems haven't been optimized. And there are really cool things that can be done, like um, like if someone knows that they're going to come into an office and work on the weekend, and typically you'd have to like talk to the building manager and tell them someone's going to be working, just turn on the entire HVAC system for like mm-hmm. from 8 to 8 on a Saturday. That's an incredible waste of energy if there's either one person working if they're not there from 8 to 8. Mm-hmm. So with the Internet of Things, you could feasibly have someone just like log into an account and be like, I'm going to be in the office in like an hour. And it'll know at exactly what time all the systems need to kick on to be able to like bring the temperature and all of their like humidity controls to the exact precise place that you would want it to be and only do all of that just for like their office, for yeah. example. That's like... Elevating smart home stuff to like smart buildings. It's very like smart home thinking. Yeah. But basically all these things exist and they could and should be implemented. And basically there's like a lack of knowledge around the requirements to set up all these things. Which I actually don't know that much about. If I can throw out those words. Like, there's, build, there's lack of knowledge in setting up yeah, smart and, systems. Yeah, having the availability for the internet of things to like fully and completely work. One of them is like from the onset knowing which communication protocols everything will be using. I that love, means very little to me. I yeah. love knowing where gaps are. That's fucking great. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, there is just there's so much cool shit and like new new buildings have been going up with the Internet of Things, basically with all this availability. And now there's gonna be they're gonna need software developers to come in and be able to use this insane wealth of information like just an incredible amount of data and be able to use this data actually usefully. And I know for a fact they're going around to people like Seattle is like the best place to be right now for this, presumably. 
Um, yeah, just having really smart people with really good ideas um, to not have internet of shit ideas. Right, and to have like just inter- like good internet of things. Right. Thing. But being able to come into a situation where everything is already, like the hardware is set up, and now all they need to do is instead of putting the internet in dumb things like on a baby's head, yeah. <laughs> just using all of this information that they know exists and coming up with creative ideas to actually use it. So you have this professional investment. Do you have you ever brought this to personal? Or is it all <laughs> professional? Not really. Yeah. Because it seems more useful in a professional sense. Uh, like, yes and no. The one thing that I was maybe going to use it for was, like, smart plugs, but I'm really frustrated that almost all smart plugs, like, use Alexa. Mm-hmm. And everyone that I know that has some device that can be controlled by Alexa, like, is an angrier person. <laughs> <laughs> because of the frustration? Yeah. Yeah. Alexa! <laughs> like, across the board. I always, like, even in videos, because, like, people watch videos with sound off, I like, can't even say the, the way it works because you are going to be like, oh shit! Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's pretty frustrating, and I imagine they're working on that. Um, but yeah, smart plugs are really cool. I was basically... I like, yeah. love smart plugs. Do you use them? Yes. How do you use them? I, um, so, being, the best thing is being able to turn off or on your lights from that. Yes, exactly, it's, that is the exact reason. It I'm is going. amazing, because you're in bed, you're watching Netflix, <laughs> you're all of a sudden like, ooh, the and, lights switch. Yeah, I'm like, and, it, <laughs> and it's just really good to just be like, device, turn off my lights, and you're done. It, it, it is a huge quality of life improvement. Mm. So I use smart plugs for that. You also can set timers on them as well, Yeah. which for waking up in the morning is also great because mm-hmm. your alarm goes off, but it also turns on your lights. So you're like, oh, I should probably get up. I might need to do that. Yeah, I, I think smart plugs are great, and it's a good like first step. A lot of people try to get crazy mm-hmm. with it. Yeah, and yeah, no, I found a smart plug that also tracks electrical usage through it. Yeah, a lot of them do that. Effing cool. <laughs> like I just also from what I do for work, but from like that perspective, want to know so much more about. All these things that people talk about, like if you turn off your computer screen, or like if you let your computer hibernate, hibernate, it's actually still using. Yeah, all is it true? Of, we can can figure that out now. Yeah. Like, really See, easily. personal science projects. See, I was talking to Amira about this mm-hmm. um, a couple weeks ago as well. Uh, we lost the audio, so unfortunately, you guys can't find us. But the whole idea of oh, I thought you were saying we lost the audio right now. No, no, no. no. I haven't. We stopped calling. <laughs> the. Uh, and the video. We lost the whole thing. Anyway. Um, hack your life. Like mm-hmm. you, we have the ability that if you wanted to, you could get all this information and cobble together your own dashboard to see your personal home energy expenditure. Yes. Which is amazing. That's super fucking rad. Well, I'll say generally, yes. Yeah. I think it's super possible. It's difficult. Yeah. From an electrical perspective, yes. If you use gas in your home, that's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, we have the potential. So that's your main interest in the Internet of Things. Yeah, and just seeing where it could lead to. I don't know. I, I also have friends that are electrical engineers, and it's really interesting hearing their perspective. Because I always come in and I'm like, all these things should be possible. Like, why the fuck haven't you guys made it happen yet? And they're like, okay, do you know how many different teams are involved in the different... Like communication steps of like what's behind the scenes in the software and like converting that to data that can like be usable. Uh, yeah, or just start yeah. using the wrong it's words. Shit. Yeah, exactly. One thing that I read about, and I need to cite this, mm-hmm. but um, Internet of Things increases like security risk. Yeah, that's the sleep. major major issue. Like I like. like I've heard, I, I gotta look this up, but the whole worry is like if you have um, an Internet of Things device like attached to a fucking nuclear reactor, mm-hmm. which is, is very feasible if not in implementation to monitor it, you can hack that pretty easily, especially if it's everywhere. It's a major concern, yeah. <laughs> I like the, um, I, I imagine also like, 
you know, alarm and alarmist news media is like, well, they'll make toilets shoot your shit right out. <laughs> <laughs> that's how someone's gonna fuck with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like that's that also fascinates me because if you if you were smart, you could get in anywhere or you could fuck with anyone. <laughs> that's what, uh, yeah, no, that's an entire conversation, but that's like hilariously how like did you ever watch like Elias or just like really any like CIA show or like mm-hmm. FBI show where they're just like they're just able to hack into any part of the building? Right, yeah. And that's that's like I, not I think about really that possible. I don't think it's kind of possible. Um and like for example, I think about the concept of robbing banks a lot. Because when, okay. like I know this is like now I'm, I'm, on, on the like, yeah, I'm on I'm on a list. Okay. okay. But the reason I think about robbing banks is it's because someone has an unfair advantage, and the only reason they're robbing a bank is because they believe they can get away with it. And the way you can get away with it is if you have better technology or knowledge than the bank itself. Mm-hmm. John Dillinger just had a lot of guns, and no one could get it, from what I understand it. Uh, but if you were we've advanced a little bit since then, what's that? Said we've advanced a little bit. Right. But the idea is, if you have an intimate understanding of how technology works, you can rob banks very easily. And like the whole idea of these hackers in movies being like, "I'm in," <laughs> very simple. It's just because they have specialized knowledge that no one else has, not even the banks. Which is, which is wild to me. And it's, the reason I think about it is people like you and me and software engineers that I know, I usually pitch the question, I was like, I asked, I was like, how reasonable do you think it is for you to rob a bank? And I'm always surprised by the answer. Do people say easy? Easy. I have talked to, like, I I don't want, like, to go under investigation, so I'm never, like, never going to let this up. But I've talked to people, I was like, so, like, what does your company company do? And he says, you know, quite honestly, it's a little bit messed up because we literally generate money out of thin air. I mean, that's the American (laughs) way. (laughs) Right, exactly. And it's crazy to me. And so when I'm thinking about the Internet of Things, of course people are going to, like, use their specialized skills to break into buildings, especially if... Not a lot of people know know how this shit works. Like what you're talking about, specialized wealth knowledge. Knowledge is power. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's my rant, my tirade on the Internet of Things. I'm not gonna rob a bank. <laughs> For the record, um, I this last one you brought up: non-belief in the central limit theorem. Mm-hmm. Was that a joke? No. Okay, so <laughs> I asked Aaron, I said, hey, what do you want to talk about? He sent me like, a list, and we've been of. going through it, and the last one was, I want to talk about my non-belief in the central limit theorem. And I showed this to my girlfriend, and she's like, what the fuck is that? I, I'm thrilled, because that's like sounds Do you look wild. up the central limit theorem? No. Yeah. Do you want to... <laughs> do you want to go into it? Uh, Let's do it! I could, well, okay, I could just say it and oversimplify it by yes. so much. I love nerd sniping Elliot by saying <laughs> this because it's ridiculous that anyone could believe that. But there's just like so much of everything in the scientific and mathematical world is like based on the central limit theorem, which is basically that if you collect enough data, that it will follow a normalized trend, like the Gaussian curve, bell curve. Okay, say so that one more time. If you collect enough data. Okay. For example, the height of men in America. Okay. And you aggregate all of this data, it will always fit a bell curve. I mean, bell curves like have a lot of different parameters basically just Okay, so spread. this is this is a theory, a proven thing, or this is something that it's, generally is it's proven, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just find that ridiculous. Ridiculous that you would that it's always, but can you always predict like where the bell is? You, uh, maybe not, but you can always bank on it being. Yeah, that it will, that it will fit into this structure. And I mean, there are like better fits with different sets of data, but. So you don't believe this? I just, it just seems too crazy to me. Like how? How could you just collect data on anything and it'll always fall into this like curve? 
healthy skepticism. I don't know. Maybe I do believe it. It just I don't. It seems like like fate, right? It just seems right. Like, it just seems like gravity, you know, or like sifting through a like using a sieve. Does that make sense? But I like so. But I could just drop a cup and I'd fall, and I believe that, you know. I don't like it. Just it's too crazy of an idea to me. This isn't gonna lead anywhere. That's fair. Just, do you I think just, it's do you think it's useful to know this? Uh, that like the central limit theorem exists. Yeah. Uh, I mean, most people have made it through their lives without knowing <laughs> yeah, the so central limit theorem. Not. So like maybe not, but I guess yeah. One like speaking of nerd snacking, one thing that Elliot brought up with me recently, uh, I was just sort of talking to him about things I was thinking about, and Elliot goes, Connor. Have you ever heard of uh, Occam's Razor? <laughs> Have you heard of this? It's the idea that the most simple explanation is most often the correct one. <laughs> which, which was fun to hear, which kind of falls into the same idea. Like it's just... Of the central limit theorem? Do you think? Like, we're not qualified to talk about this. No. <laughs> no, exactly. I was like, when you ask me what you want to talk, I was like, let's make a list of things that I can only speculate about. I've never research enough really it's to interesting be able to, to talk know. about it. Um, how's your... How's your $20 social accountability going? Basically, Aaron is notoriously late. Yeah. Mm. And... It's a fatal character. He form. has made a re- resolution that if he is late to anything, he owes the person that he made plans with $20. I was watching it today. He arrived at 3.02 when he said 3, and I have a five-minute grace period. So, uh, yeah, five minutes. Yeah, exactly. so I was like, you're in it. You're fine. How, like, how is that working, and has it changed anything? It, yeah, it has changed things. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it was because I was uh, – basically, I got dinner with um, a couple friends of mine, and I was like – <laughs> like 45 minutes late or something um, and usually I can come up with like an incredible amount of excuses but this time uh, I had eaten edibles <laughs> I was like cleaning my house yeah. and I literally put down my phone and when I finally checked the clock again I was like fuck I'm so late <laughs> so I showed up and basically one of my friends who is not one to uh basically to say anything that might, uh, like, like he's a soft-spoken person. And so when he says things that are important, they're like actually something right. that he's thought about and are very important. Yeah. And basically, to paraphrase, he was like, by consistently showing up late to things, what that, what that means, if whether or not that's what you intended to mean, is that you value your time more than their time. And that's the bare minimum of friendship that you could ask for in friendship is that your time is worth the same so that's incredibly fucked up wow <laughs> sounds like him yeah <laughs> but, but it meant a lot to me that yeah. he said that right because it takes a lot to say something like that so in the new year I made this resolution because apparently I can't just keep myself accountable um, that there would have to be like money monetary <laughs> attachments <laughs> to this him. yeah um and it's been working really well. I, I, it's forcing me to actively think much more critically about when I actually need to leave the house and not this like idealistic view of like, yeah, I could shower and make coffee in 10 minutes and catch the... No, that's no. False. How many payouts? Okay, so there's been two payouts. Uh, one of them, I, if I could go back to that moment, it would not have counted. Um, because I'm also sort of developing what it yeah. yeah. Like, for example, showing up at three for this obviously counts as yeah. you need to show up by three. This is like right. an appointment. Um, the first payout was, it was before a concert that I was going to with, uh, with Mira and a couple other mm-hmm. friends. And basically, um, I'd started this group message. So I was just like, did you guys want to meet up before? Like, are we going to get drinks? And I was actually with someone else at the time and it turned into like a really important like we were doing really important like we were sort of having like big moments together yeah. and so I hadn't really checked my phone but ultimately I just needed to be on time to this concert and so I ended up checking my phone and they're like yeah let's meet at 6 30 which I was never going to be able to make like mm. at any point so I never agreed to anything and I ended up showing up at like 
720 or something. And I got low-key harassed into... So I just threw 20 in the tail. I was like, I'll buy you guys all the drink. But, but in reality, I should not have paid because essentially no one was like waiting for me. The fact that I wasn't there didn't really... It was a little more fluid and there was no like formalized agreement. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just made me think a lot more about the intent of this actual resolution because it's very... I mean, it's just very absolutist in the way that I set it up. Like, like there is no reason that I couldn't... that I shouldn't make this appointment right now, for example. Mm-hmm. And if I did have to not make it, then I need to cancel that ahead of time. With yeah. You. Yeah. That's super cool. That's, that's like what I specialize in. <laughs> and it's really cool to hear like you like learn this. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a work in motion. So so the other payout was uh it was actually yesterday. Uh-huh. And I was gonna go to the women's march with Jacob and Ashley. Jacob was like, I sort of actually offered up his house <laughs> to host people beforehand. He created a Facebook event, it's supposed to be seven right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh <laughs> I like woke up kinda late and texted him, like, I'm going to be there closer to 8, and I showed up at 8.30. And that was very clearly, like, like he yeah. had woken up earlier for me, actually showed up on time, and they were waiting. They were, like, they're waiting. If I showed up at 8, I don't know if I would have paid up, but I walked into the door with, like, 10 in each hand for Ashley and Jacob. Like, I fucked up, and I'm very sorry. Like, Go. Yeah. How old are you? 28. 28? Yeah, as of December. That's right. I think about this because one of my favorite quotes is in your, like, from your, in your 20s, you make your habits. And then from your 30s onwards, your habits make you. And so I was trying to figure out, like, are you still in that window <laughs> where you can, like, <laughs> please? <laughs> yeah. Some things I need to iron out still before my 30s. <laughs> I, I mean, being on time, I think there are clear, clear benefits. Yeah, I don't know if I fully agree with that statement, but uh, it, it, um, I can already see the exact ways that I'm trying to be more on time to things. On, on January 1st, I was first put to the test, I was meeting up with two friends in San Francisco, and I did the thing where I left as late as possible from my house, mm. uh, <laughs> because I hate showing up when other people aren't there. Which is hilariously what I do to people all the time, but um, fucking asshole. <laughs> but but I ended up like uh, it was like we're meeting at this restaurant. I was driving, and literally it is the time that I'm supposed to meet. So we're in the five minute window now. I was like, fuck. Like there might not be parking there if I get caught in the lights. So I ended up parking two yeah. blocks away and just fucking sprinted all the way to the restaurant. I got there with like one minute to spare. And that was really funny to me. I'm like, this is what it took for me to make the first dinner. <laughs> like, I, couldn't have just, I just couldn't have left five minutes earlier. Like, wow. That's rad. Carrot and stick, dude. That's the yeah. way to do it. So since then, there's been, uh, like, now I'll carry a Kindle. Like, I always have something productive to do in case I do show up before. In that time. Yeah, because there's, I always have shit to read. There's always things that I could be doing. Modern cynicism. <laughs> For example, yeah. yeah. This has been rad. Mm-hmm. We t- on the second half, we touched on the Internet of Things primarily, and then just ventured into just other shit that we may or may not be qualified to talk about. But thanks very much for coming on the show. Themes have been emerging. Like, mainly it's people trying to figure out the best way to use technology in a way that doesn't make them depressed, <laughs> which has been, like, universal across talking about. Yeah. My general method is back away from it. Yeah. Slowly focus. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for coming again. And Thank you for having me. Yeah. We'll see you on time somewhere. Uh, or I'll owe you $20. Yeah. <laughs>